many, many reasons. And there were times in the year where things seemed very bleak in terms of our researchers being out of the labs, in terms of our fundraising. But we have kind of come around. I think COVID reminded us how fragile we are as a human race. It also reminded us of the importance of research as we sat waiting for somebody to deliver a vaccine so we could get back to normal life, as they say. For those of you who are less than familiar with Breakthrough Cancer Research, we're a medical research charity based in Cork, Ireland, and we're entirely focused on cancer. We're focused on cancer with the idea that we want more people to survive. And we look at research at every point in the patient journey. So that's everything from cancer prevention in the first place, all the way through early diagnosis and, and biomarkers and better ways to catch cancer early through new treatments and then through survivorship to somebody having as close to back to their normal life after a cancer diagnosis when thankfully more people can survive cancer than ever before. And Breakthrough looks at ourselves as having this almost privileged pace in the middle between the patients and the supporters and those who want to advocate and come for and see more research happening and between the clinicians and the researchers. And our model is that the clinicians, the people who are on the front lines treating cancer should work with um, people who are in more academic research centers working kind of at the bench side, but the other person in that kind of trifecta grouping is the patient. Everything from that the research should be focused on achieving something that's going to make their life better, but also can we get that input in from the earliest stage possible so that when we come out with something at the end, it's effective and it's what a patient would like to see. So I suppose if you're involved in fundraising, then you hear the stories of all the people who are looking for better treatments, um, less invasive treatments and um, better ways to overcome cancer. And because of that, I mean, we really want to make sure those voices are heard. And I think formats and fora like this are really the way that that's going to happen. And we want to see more and more of that because it makes sure that we're not doing research for research sake. We're doing research that's going to make a better impact at the patient level. And if we don't have that input, then we can't make sure that's happening. Um, so. I suppose, well, I just want to, you know, um, Francis has given a very comprehensive review. I just want to encourage everybody to take this opportunity to learn from each other. For those who are the researchers, to be open to hearing the feedback from the patients and or the public who are listening, who are coming to ask questions because maybe sometimes as researchers, we use language that is unfamiliar to the public. Um, you know, we use a lot of big words. I know one of the very first scientific meetings I'd been to in a long time, I sat and everybody used acronyms for, um, for genes. They used it for cell lines. They use it and nobody except the people very close would have understood what that research was about. So take it uh, as a constructive kind of um, opportunity for people to learn from each other, for researchers to find ways to better explain their research and also to get the input of the, of the public and the patients into what they're trying to achieve. Is there something that we haven't thought of? None of us should be so arrogant to think we have all the answers. And so I want to also encourage the patients and the public who are listening to do your very best to, to ask questions. Don't be afraid. If there's no silly question, this is our opportunity to just say, look, we are a team. We're working together. We want the best type of research to happen. And we can only do that if we collectively work together in that way. So I just want to conclude by again saying thank you to everybody for listening. Thank you, especially to the people who are giving their talks today and giving their time. And a big thank you also to Francis for making the whole event happen. So I'm going to jump off now and look forward to hearing some really um, interesting talks about the research that's happening at this moment. So thank you. Thank you, Orla. That's great. So I want to invite our first speaker, um, Dr. John McCrill from UCC. Um, Dr. John McCrill is a senior lecturer who's working on um, the very cellular level, and he's going to introduce his research today. So I'm going to ask him to share his screen now. So you're very welcome, John. Thank you for the introduction. Can everyone see that? So, yeah, uh, yeah, it's good. Good stuff. Good. So, um, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my screen, is, my, the slideshow is not working, actually. That's kind of annoying. No, you'd be fine, John. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, you'd be able to, 
try again there. Oh, that's it. No, it's going. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so uh, thank you. Yeah. So, thank you for the opportunity to um, present some of my research. Uh, thanks to both Breakthrough and to the PPI panel. I, I really appreciate it. Um, so, as Francis says, I'm a I'm a, a, a cellular and molecular physiologist. So, I'm interested in the way things work at the level of cells and below that. Um, I also, I guess, I make a contribution to um, to to the treatment of cancer maybe indirectly too as an educator because I train both scientists and medical students. So I'm hoping in the long term that part of my job will also contribute to, um, to combating cancer. So anyway, my research project uh, funded by Breakthrough is focused on um, esophageal cancer. So the esophagus is, the, uh, is commonly known as the gullet. So it's the tube that links the mouth to the stomach. And if you cut a section for it like this, if you cut it across this way and look down, you'll see that there's a layer of kind of muscular cells that kind of help push the food along by contracting, by, by squeezing it along the tube. And there's also a layer of uh, cells that line this tube. And the cells that line the tube are of two different types. There are ones that are called squamous cells, which are basically called that because they're square. And they form like a, a smooth lining that the food can pass along. There are also cells that are glandular cells, and these are cells that secrete mucus. So you probably would have all heard of mucus. So mucus helps lubricate this tube and helps the food slip along. So that's the function of the normal esophagus, to basically allow smooth transfer of food from the mouth to the stomach. But there are also cancers that occur in the lining cells of the esophagus. And these, these are squamous um, cancers. And you can see here that the cancer cells that I've kind of drawn in orange here have started to do unusual things. They started to grow on top of each other, which is something that normal cells don't do. And that will lead to the formation of a tumor. And it will also cause disruption of the normal function of the, uh, of the esophagus. The glandular cells also can become cancerous. They're called adenocarcinomas, but I'm calling them glandular cancers here. And in this case, they've not only uh, divided more and started to grow on top of each other, but they've also started to stop their normal function, stop producing mucus. So my big question is what turns normal squamous cells in the, in the esophagus into cancer, esophageal cancer cells, or what turns normal glandular cells into um, glandular cancer cells? So here are some of the known risk factors of uh, esophageal cancer, so of squamous esophageal cancer. So first of all, there's age. Age is a, a risk factor in most diseases. The older you are, the more likely you are to have uh, squamous esophageal cancer. Another factor is gender. Males are three times more likely to suffer from this disorder. Uh, nationality is a big issue too as well. Um, Asians and Africans are more likely to suffer from this disorder than Europeans or, or, or Americans. Um, smoking and consumption of alcohol are also linked in as are genetic factors, factors that are inherited from the parents to the children and could be passed down through generations. When you look at the glandular forms of the cancer, again, age and gender are similar factors. But in this case, um, Europeans and Americans are far more likely to suffer from this disorder. And there are also other risk factors that are unique to this glandular form of esophageal cancer. There's what's called uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, which the major symptom of is heartburn, and Barrett's esophagus. There's also uh, dietary factors and obesity is a major factor in this disease too. And there are also genetic influences, inherited ge influences. So why am I interested in acid as a potential um, cause of esophageal cancer? When you look at the stomach, it's very acidic. Um, it's pH, which is a scale of its acidity, is between one and two. The lower this number is, the more acidic a, a solution is and more acidic a, a liquid is. So battery acid has a pH of somewhere between zero and one. The stomach has a pH of somewhere between one and two. When you look at the esophagus, the normal esophagus has a pH of around seven. So this is neutral. This is neither alkaline nor acidic. It's the same pH as water. However, in um, gastroesophageal reflux disease or GALD, the valve between the stomach and the esophagus is defective. It stays open too often. It's normally only open when food is passing from the esophagus into the gut. 
But in gold, it stays open too many times. It opens up too frequently. Um, and basically this leads to um, an acidification of the esophagus. The pH drops from seven to less than four during this uh, reflux. And what this does is it causes inflammation and changes in the cells lining the esophagus um, as a result of this change in pH. This in turn can lead to a disorder called uh, Barrett's esophagus, which is a precursor to esophageal cancer. It's a, it's a major risk factor in esophageal fat, uh, cancer. So what I'm really interested in is how can acid cause alterations in esophageal cells? And the area that I've been interested in throughout my scientific career um, for over nearly 25 years now, I think, is calcium as a signal within cells. So calcium is a major component of the Earth's crust. It's a fifth, uh, the fifth most abundant element in the Earth's crust. And it's also the fifth most abundant element in your body. The majority of calcium in your body is tied up in the teeth and the bones. Um, but when this uh, element is dissolved in water, it loses some electrons, it becomes positively charged and forms calcium ions. And calcium ions are a key signal inside cells. So here's an example of a cell. This is measuring calcium. So the, the purple colors here are low calcium, as are blue colors. Uh, yellows and reds are high calcium. And we've treated the cell, this is actually a, over about five minutes, with a substance that's going to raise its calcium. You can see it goes up and then down again. So we can measure calcium inside the cell using, uh, using uh, special dyes. And this will enable us to measure calcium in esophageal cells and how they respond to acid. Is there a calcium response to acid in esophageal cells? So to sum up what, what we're aiming to do, I'm early on in this project, is to look to see, um, do esophageal cells respond to acid with an increase in calcium? And if they do, how do they do this? So we're going to do this using microscopy, a special form of microscopy, and we've been growing esophageal cells in the lab. Um, but this question, how do they do it? Which mechanisms, which switches in the cell enable it to sense calcium and cause a rise in calcium? And then finally, what are the consequences of this, of this in terms of cancer cell biology? Do the cells start to grow in a disordered fashion? Do they start to stop to produce mucus, for example? And the overall reason for doing this uh, research is to potentially, in the long term, uh, develop ways of uh, preventing or curing esophageal cancer. Because if acid causes calcium signals that change cells, we might be able to stop them by using drugs that stop the switches that cause these uh, responses. So that's the long-term aim. And there's also the idea of basic knowledge. We, um, not a lot really is known about how acid causes changes in, in any cell type. So we want to find more about this and ideally, we might be able to use this um, research in the long term to help combat esophageal cancer. So on that note, I'm going to uh, stop sharing the screen and uh, I'll pass it back to Francis. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. That was a very nice uh, introduction to the cellular level. Um, and now we're going to ask Pat um, to share his screen. So Dr. Pat Ford is a principal investigator in cancer research at UCC. And um, Pat has been looking at a new treatment really for um, cancer called electrochemotherapy. So Pat. Yeah, can you see it there now? Um, perfectly, thank you very much. And I'm just gonna turn it off. Lovely, thank you. No problem. Um, hello, um, my name is Dr. Patrick Ford. Um, I'm um, a researcher here at the CAR Cancer um, Center at UCC. And um, we're working on a, an area called electrochemotherapy. So, just to give you a bit of a background. So, electroporation, or sorry, electrochemotherapy basically is the combination of electric, electro, electric pulses. And these electric pulses are um, optimized in a way to only um, target, as in target cancer cells as opposed to healthy cells. So, these electric pulses, when you apply them across the cell membrane, which is here uh, in the schematic, um, it creates little holes or pores and allows your um, drug, or if you want to look at gene therapy, your gene to cross 
the cell membrane. And, um, oops, sorry. And once it's inside there, it's able to do its job, which is hopefully is to, to kill the cell. Um, so before we can do this, we want to show whether electroporation can actually um, create these pores. So this is a, um, um, a representation of um, electroporation under the microscope. And on the left-hand side, you can see a cell membrane before the pulse. And um, in the middle, you can see the electroporation, um, electric pulse being uh, applied across the cell. And you can see these holes appearing in the cell. And the interesting part, of, which is what we are really interested in, is the once after a few minutes post the electric pulse, you can see that the cell membrane goes back to normal. So basically it closes so it doesn't damage. We don't want it to damage the, ca the cancer cell or the, um, the, um, the healthy cell. What we want to do is the, to allow the, the substance, the drug to get in and the drug will do its job or as a function as in to kill the cancer cell. So, so we, as I said already, we are interested in is combining it with chemotherapies. So this is just a video of showing us that the, the, the um, cell is um, applied, the electric pulse applied to the cell, the drug goes in, the pores reseal and traps the drug inside there, and that's what, and then the drug will do its job. So this is called electrochemotherapy, the combination of the drug with the electro, electric pulse. Uh, so um, I think, um, so, so when you're doing something in the lab, you, you want to show us in the cells before you actually jump into the patients. So um, this is just, the slides here is just to show that um, the, um, uh, cells, these are pancreatic cells that are being treated with electrochemotherapy. So the, so the blue dots basically is the cancer cell that had grown and does um, died with blue, was a blue dye to show that it, it's, it's surviving. So, um, so the interesting part is the, the upper tree um, um, plates and then the bottom tree plates. So the upper tree plates is an untreated cancer. So these cells are growing and the bottom um, flasks are the treated with the electric pulse and, uh, and the drug. So with the, I use three commonly used um, chemotherapy drugs that are used with patients. And you can see the difference between the untreated and the, the combination that there is a dramatic um, decrease in number of cells, as opposed to this, the drug only, which is the second lot of um, plates, they're showing that the growth is similar to, um, to the untreated. So another interesting part with the electroporation, electrochemotherapy protocol is that you're able to use uh, a lot less um, drug. And in, in some trials, they've shown that you can use up to a hundred fold less drug. So you, 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 you don't have this, the side effects of chemotherapy that you would have uh, with, with um, conventional chemotherapy treatments. Uh, the next slide, um, some people may not like, um, but I think it's important to show how um, how dramatic the treatment is. So this is a, a mouse um, um, slide. So so the top left is an um, day zero. So this is um, day zero of the treatment, and the second right is day two. So you can see there is um, some. Um, some um, response and by but then by day 30 you can see that um, the, the electric chemotherapy has had a drastic effect that has decreased from day zero to, to day 30 that um, has responded and we've shown across different types of cancers that this is effective uh, when you combine with um, electroporation and the chemotherapy so you can see at the bottom we can we use in different um, cancer cells so so colon and pancreatic for example and esophageal um, so um, Cork got involved with electrochemotherapy as part of a, 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 a multi-four um, centered trial. And um, we have treated many patients and mostly subcutaneous mel like melanoma. And this is just an example of a patient who had a melanoma on its scalp. And why I'm showing this is that yes, when you treat with when you treat the patients, there is a response, but you can see in the middle picture that there's little needle marks. So the electrodes used for treating patients are needle based and the only damage that you can see is from those, ne is, is from those needles. 
and by and then post treatment, which is ten days, which is the right picture, you can see these needle marks have disappeared. So you so the treatment is not damaging healthy cells, so but it's actually killing the cancer. So that's what you want. We don't want to damage the um, cancer cells. Sorry there. So. Um, so we have worked in the cancer research with our clinical partners for, um, with many patients, and you can see the upper, um, this is an example of a basal cell carcinoma, and the upper two pictures is the picture pre-treatment, and the, the bottom picture is three months, and this is showing post-treatment. Uh, the location of this um, BCC is on his eyelid, so this patient would have been offered surgery, but um, up to the out of surgery, and um, you can see, with surgery, you would have some scarring, but you can see from here, there is a cosmetic effect on, a positive cosmetic effect on this, with this treatment and the location. So this treatment can be used in areas that um, would, would, would help the patient's um, outcome. Um, this is another example of a patient. Um, this is a Merkel cell carcinoma. Um, so this patient has um, the Merkel cell coma, as you can see on the left, um, right under her eye. And um, this has got, I think it had two treatments and you can see post-treatment two years later, that it's totally resolved. And um, the quality of life of this patient, um, because this patient would have been offered surgery and it, this would be quite complicated. And because of her age, it would have been quite difficult and, and healing would be slow. Um, so we, in cancer research, we want to expand the electroporation pr um, procedure from, um, which is traditionally used ex for external tumors. So skin-based subcutaneous tumors like melanoma and breast. And we wanted to bring this treatment into um, into the in, in internal for to reach internal cancers. So we started thinking and developing a um, new device um, called an Indivay, which could target um, colorectal or esophageal cancers. Um, so traditionally, the, the probes would have been made with needles, but we changed and we looked at what could be used instead of needles. So we went up to for plate electrodes. And these plate electrodes basically are on either side of this chamber. And um, this chamber, it connects to a conventional endoscope and you use the camera of the endoscope. And we also have a vacuum. So when you, when you go in with your endoscope, you locate where the tumor is and you place this chamber over the tumor and the tumor then is sucked into the, into the chamber and by a vacuum, and the, this would basically put in contact the tissue with the electric um, electrodes, and then you deliver the electric pulse. Um, the drug is already given systemically, so at a low level, so the, the holes will open in the cells and the drug will get in and the, you, will, um, you will go through the, the electroporation procedure. But what you do then, then is you release the, um, the, the vacuum the, the tumor is um, released from the chamber and then you move it to the next tumor or it's along that tumor. So this is a um, this is half a centimeter in width. So like if your tumor is bigger than half a centimeter, you can just move it around until you treat the entire um, um, area of the tumor. Um, so um, we collaborated with a clinical, um, a vet clinic, um, in Cork and um, we treated um, pets. These are pets that come in and they have spontaneous tumors and we offer this as a free treatment to validate our service um, or treatment and um, the, 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 the pets would be treated um, or else um, otherwise they would have um, not had um, surgery. They wouldn't be able for surgery. So this is um, one um, which is a colorectal tumor and we treat this dog and um, you can see the at day zero, it's like a meatball stuck in a tube, as I call it. And you can see by day 235, this is totally resolved. And um, this dog survived and, and um, it was, so it proved the, that the, 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 the protocol works in a spontaneous tumor. Um, this is another dog. It's a colorectal lymphoma. It's partially obstructed and similar here um, by day 60. You can see there that the results um, are, is, is self-apparent that uh, it has treated and the tumor has resolved. 
So this led into a, um, a phase one clinical trial with, uh, we hope to treat 10 patients, but we treated seven. So this is back in 2010. Uh, this is pre and post treatment um, and with the end of a, the next slide probably gives you more of um, uh, response. So this is the MRI of the same patient. So this is, it looks small in the MRI. So this is the tumor here and this is the post treatment. Then you can see that the, the, this tumor has resolved. And this is this one was really exciting. So this then um, this treatment has shown that it has worked. So we have expanded this on to a clinical clinical trial. This trial has been completed with between Ireland and Denmark, and we have now um, bring it forward to compare this treatment to um, um, to the standard treatment, which would be surgery for the for colorectal cancer. Um, so. Um, this electrochemotherapy is seen as a local treatment and we want to bring this forward and see can we make a systemic treatment. So what I mean by local treatment is that the, the pulses are delivered locally to the tumour and the, the treatment only happens within the tumour. But what we have seen and other groups have seen is that there is a response of different tumors that have not been treated within the patient. So there's obviously something happening and we looked at whether there was a, a immune response. So we did a very generic and we, uh, measure of different immune cells. And you can see that they are immune cells um, in, the, in the local tumor post treatment. And what we want to do next is start combining maybe with the newer therapies, the, immune, the new immune therapies, to see whether we can bring this therapy from a local treatment to a systemic treatment to target the, 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 the secondaries around the body. So that's kind of where we would like to bring the treatment. Um, so the next, this slide, I think, is just kind of showing how, um, one of, showing how it's a developing treatment. So the, the first one, First four, first three really of these papers are, are cell based, and the next two are, our next three are um, animal based, or sorry, large animal based, and the last two are clinically related. So, so what's interesting is that our patient, our first patient, was treated in 2010 with the endoscopic um, therapy. Um, our dog um, work was was published in 2016, and our first phase one trial was, was, was published in 2020. So it shows that, that, work, that the work does not happen straight away, that the results take time. So like our first patient was treated back in 2010, and our trial has completed and, and published by 2020. So it took us 10 years to get from that stage to, to, the, to the phase one trial. So it's a developing therapy. And we're also looking at different drugs. For example, two, two weeks ago, we recently published a paper looking using calcium and electroporation and use, looking at that as a, as a new therapy for our new drug and um, therapy for melanoma. And we found that there is an immune response um, being, being produced post that therapy as well. So, so it's a developing therapy and um, we're excited about the results. So, um, so that's it. So thank you very much for your for listening to me today and thank you to Breakthrough Cancer Research for all their support and asking me to, to present. So thank you. Thank you, Pat. Um, that's very interesting to see the development from um, the lab to, um, a to the clinic, to the patient. And we have some questions for you there, Pat, um, sure. but we'll, we're going over a bit now, so we'll keep them to the end. And we ask Erin then to share her screen, please. Thank you, Erin. So Erin is a nutrition, a, di a registered dietitian, but also just got her PhD last week. And so congratulations, Erin. And she's going to tell Tell us about um, the importance of nutrition in cancer. So if I get you to share your screen now, please. Yeah, I'm um, just checking out if that's working there. That is, yeah, lovely. Thank you. Perfect. Um, okay. So um, my name is Erin. Um, thank you, Francis, for the introduction. Um, I work with uh, Dr. Eva Ryan in the um, UCC Clinical Nutrition Oncology Research Group and um, our contact details are here if you have any interest in contacting us but I suppose our main interest is in malnutrition in cancer and this um, picture here you can just see the importance of this area of research so I suppose malnutrition in cancer is incredibly um, common 
you can see here, if you look at the maps, um, if you look at the section of Ireland, this is just some work I did as part of my PhD actually. And um, I estimated that there's over 7,000 cancer patients every year in Ireland affected by clinically significant weight loss that impacts um, clinical outcomes of survival, tolerance for treatment, that sort of thing. And similarly with um, low muscle mass that's visible on a CT scan, there's over 7,000 patients every year who are affected. And if you think of this in the context that we only have about 35 um, oncology dietitians in the country. So you can imagine that there's a real lack of um, access to care there. So our research kind of focuses around this. Um, the questions that I'm gonna go through today um, the research questions are, I suppose, we're interested in how common is malnutrition in cancer? Um, do patients have access to support during the cancer journey? So everywhere from diagnosis up into um, recovery and remission. Um, do patients use alternative diets and supplements? This is something we hear a lot anecdotally, but we want to know, we want to have numbers and actually, you know, see is it just being, uh, is it being accurately represented? And then also the most important part really, um, how we can actually help patients nutritionally throughout the cancer journey. So um, compared to some of the other presentations beforehand now, I'm actually going to go through a couple of different methodologies. So different ways that we approach these questions. So the first um, one that I'm gonna talk about is observational research. So this is where we're just looking at patients that um, have been diagnosed with cancer and we do various things. So we um, get patients to fill out surveys on their symptoms and their quality of life. And then we look at their chart review and we look at their medical charts to review this and get information on their clinical status. And then um, something unique that our group does is that we look at CT scans and we use this to um, quantify how much muscle um, and fat people have throughout treatment. So if you look at the CT scan there, which you're probably familiar enough with seeing from your own treatment, um, this is taken at the level of about the belly button. And then if we do an analysis and we can actually show which parts of this are muscle and which parts are fat. So you can see here the blue and the green are fat and then the red is muscle. So in this person, you can see like this red muscle should all be pretty well um, connected, but this person has experienced muscle loss. So there's lots of gaps in between and this is associated with poor outcomes. So we then look at, and um, we get an exact number on this, how many centimeters squared of muscle and fat we have. And we can relate that to how long people survive. And we find that people that are able to maintain their muscle mass survive um, a lot longer. So it shows the importance of actually dealing with nutritional issues. Importantly as well, you can see here that this person has lost a lot of muscle but they still have quite a lot of fat. So that's in the light blue and the green. This is um, a fat. So when we have a population of cancer patients that a lot of them are experiencing overweight and obesity, it's really important to note that that does not mean that they cannot have lost muscle underneath that. So or, and health professionals and patients themselves should be aware that just because you might have a BMI in the overweight or obese range, that does not mean that you cannot be malnourished. And this is often difficult to pick up then using simple tools in the clinic. Um, in 2018, we did another survey, which we um, we recruited over a thousand patients, and this one was nationwide, not just in Cork. And this one was all patient reports, so it was all patient report outcomes. Um, and we found that 36% of patients had reported that they had lost weight unintentionally. Um, and then 23 as well actually reported gaining weight. So that's something that sometimes we don't really think about, um, but it's quite common in some treatments like breast cancer or um, prostate cancer where people are receiving hormone therapies. However, despite these massive numbers of people being affected by um, weight changes and nutritional issues, only 39%, so uh, about just over a third of patients actually saw a dietitian. Um, and then also, the same amount we're using alternative diets and supplements. So some of these diets can be quite dangerous. They can be very restrictive and actually promote weight loss um, and they can cause issues with quality of life. So we knew from the reports of dietitians working in clinical settings that patients were using these, but we didn't really have a number. So now we know that in Ireland, over a third of patients have actually tried um, some sort of anti-cancer diet or a supplement. So it's really important that we have that information. And as well as that, um, about a third of patients as well report avoiding specific foods, which depending on what type of food, if it's just one food, maybe that's not a problem. But if they're avoiding entire food groups, that can, again, put a real risk on their nutrition status. So 
the reason that this research is actually important for patients is that by knowing how many people are affected, um, it's not just a number. We can use this number to encourage funding from more oncology dietitians so that more patients actually have access to the care that they need. And also to by showing the vast number of people that are affected, we can prioritize research into effective treatments. Um, and then by knowing that the malnutrition can happen in people of all sizes, we can use that to just reiterate to health professionals that they can't assume that somebody is well nourished just because they have excess fat. Um, and we really need to be screening for malnutrition in outpatients because, um, you know yourself, most, most cancer care is happening on an outpatient basis. And at the moment, most hospitals are only screening for nutrition issues when you're admitted as an inpatient. So that's often too late. And then you might be quite frail at that point. And importantly, in our research as well, it's hearing the patient's own experience of nutrition. So when we when we find out what patients are actually concerned about themselves and how they're experiencing it, we can promote better communication between healthcare professionals and patients themselves, and also inform future interventions based on patients' own concerns. So and um, like Frances was saying when she was describing the public patient involvement at the start, that's kind of the lowest level of um, public patient involvement, but just patients who complete our surveys, we know what they want, and then we can use that to guide our research further. But um, there's other levels of involvement as well that I'll mention in further uh, sections. So another, when I talked about the questions about how do we help patients um, with cancer deal with their nutrition, our group has done interventional studies. Um, so that includes randomized control trials of anti-inflammatory nutrients. So those are fatty acids. Um, and that was in esophageal cancer. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to do more of these sort of um, intervention studies where we're actually looking for a way to manage malnutrition and cancer in the future. Unfortunately, these studies um, are harder to get funding for and they require a lot more funding. Um, so that's why it's really important to get um, patient engagement and involvement with charities, especially like Breakthrough, which um, help with the research of our group. Um, specifically, Breakthrough have helped with the development of resources um, including cookbooks for patients, survivors, and the general public as well for cancer prevention. So you can see here a selection of cookbooks that were produced um, by uh, Dr. Eva Ryan and Dr. Edi Nuvukla. And they um, range from just the blue book here, which is good nutrition for anybody that has cancer who needs to have a high protein, high calorie diet. Um, and then there's a book specially written for people with pancreatic cancer and the green one, um, especially for people who have swallowing difficulties. So it has soft diet and lots of smoothies and things for people who have trouble swallowing anything harder. Um, and you can get access to all of these books at this link here um, on the Breakthrough website. As well as that, um, more recently, there's been um, the anti-cancer cookbook, which um, has been released and that has um, lots of recipes for healthy eating. So, you know, um, the diet that research has shown is most likely to prevent cancer. Um, and then similarly, there's another book for cancer survivors, because once you've gotten through the initial cancer journey, the best way to prevent a recurrence um, that you can have an impact on is to help, is to, you know, make sure that your diet is corresponding with a healthy diet. So these cookbooks are useful for that. And these were all of these cookbooks were funded by um, Breakthrough and in particular the anti-cancer cookbook which is on sale now and um, all of the royalties for that are going to Breakthrough as well so it's funding further cancer research. The research that we're doing at the moment um, is based on complementary and alternative medicine in cancer and this is based on our previous survey we want to know how many people are using all sorts of complementary and alternative medicine not just um, diets and supplements but also everything from um, yoga acupuncture reiki um, that sort of thing and then you know even people who have decided not to have any conventional treatment so in order to get a good picture of how many people are using these therapies across the country we're hoping to recruit over a thousand patients um, and survivors so that's at anybody at any stage so literally from the day that you're diagnosed up until um you know the rest of your life and we're also hoping to get um, responses from 200 health professionals because we need to know also how health professionals are interacting with patients who choose these therapies and what their opinions of it are. Um, so if you're interested um, in taking part in these studies, there are the links to sign up and also you can feel free to share them. Um, 
you can get in touch with me if you have any questions about this survey. Um, this one in particular is funded by Irish Cancer Society and I'm just going to use as an example to go through um, basically how we had public patient involvement because this study from, from the very start we've had two patient representatives involved. Um, so Kate Curtin, who was mentioned um, previously in the presentation, she's um, involved and also we have Eileen. Um, and basically going back to the very start when we were applying for funding and um, for this study, they were helping us with the grant application and um, telling us what was important to patients. So then when we got approval to or we got funding to do the study, we started designing the survey. And we were able to liaise really closely with Aline and Kay and ask them what therapies are currently popular. You know, they know they're in touch with a lot of people on the ground who have cancer and they know what's popular at the moment. So we wanted to make sure that our survey was relevant to people right now and not using outdated information um, based on, you know, some of the research that's available. It might be 10 years since that was conducted and the things that people are doing could have changed a lot now. So we were also able to and actually get their opinions on what mattered to patients like some questions we had they felt it didn't really matter and other questions that we didn't even think to put in they were like oh why aren't you asking this so this means that the outcome of this research is ultimately going to be more useful to patients um whereas if we had involved public patient involvement in this we we wouldn't have those questions at all it wouldn't even have occurred to us um as researchers and then as well something that's really important is we wanted to make sure that our wording was sensitive and not unintentionally offensive or judgmental and this was something as well that we got a lot of help from um, Kay and Eileen with and even um, some things like you know limiting unnecessary questions that might um, put people off or make people a bit suspicious like why are they asking this it doesn't seem related um, so hopefully we've minimized that at least with the help of um, uh, Kay and Eileen and then once we launched the survey they were really useful for telling us what sort of um, avenues to go down to advertise the survey they were saying that um, Twitter is really really popular amongst people who are using alternative and complementary therapies so we made sure that we have advertisements on there we also wanted to advertise in hospitals of course um, and usually we would have actually gone out and done this ourselves but due to COVID um, we're not really able to access the hospitals for research at the moment so we are depending heavily on um, clinicians that are working in hospitals to help hand out flyers and posters and that as well as the online advertisement so um, again, if anybody has any um, ability to help us advertise that, we'd greatly appreciate that. But um, our patient representatives, again, we still are in contact like every couple of weeks. I'm emailing them asking, oh, you know, um, do you think I should advertise with this group or that group? And then they also suggested that we make sure that the results of the study are going to be available to patients because sometimes people spend 40 minutes or an hour filling out a survey and then it's gone and they never hear about it again. And they felt that people would be more encouraged to take part and feel like their time was valued if they were actually going to get some feedback on the results. So um, they will also be really helpful now when we're writing up our report. Um, and as a result of that suggestion also, when you sign up for the study you do, you can take a box to say that you want to get a summary of the results afterwards. Um, again, something we wouldn't have thought to do at all if we hadn't involved them. So this particular study, um, the importance of this is that if we know how common complementary and alternative medicine use is, we can help advise health professionals um, to ask about it and to be aware of potential interactions with maybe some supplements um, and conventional medications. And also um, by knowing what the health professionals themselves think, we can help re-educate health professionals and encourage them to have open non-judgmental conversations because a lot of people just don't tell their health professionals if they're using these because they're afraid of being judged or things like that. So it's really important that we can see what the health professionals and the patients are thinking so that we can actually merge that and get you know, a useful dialogue going. And ultimately then again, by hearing the patient's own experience, which is really important with these survey studies, we'll be able to find out what, me what needs are actually being met, like why are patients choosing to use these therapies and which ones of the ones that we know are relatively safe and affordable, are there any ones that patients actually feel are really valuable um, and what does that help them with? 
so hopefully this can all be used then in a clinical setting pretty it's pretty easily transferable you know we just need to educate the health professionals so we hope to get a big response on this um study and um hopefully really yeah we'll have quite a quite a quick response we'll be able to help make things better in terms of communication so um i think we're going to hold the questions until the end francis but um we will thank you very yeah. much Erin. that was really useful and we've had some great interaction here on the chat and on the q a as well and um, but yeah. we'll, we'll just hold them for now and um, emer i might ask you to share your screen now so dr emer Gern is a physiotherapist and lecturer in TCD and she does tremendous work to help people recover from like straight after surgery and during treatment um, to recover muscle etc so she's going to talk to you about the importance of this in cancer recovery thank you very much Erin Emer <laughs> thanks Francis Thank you. And thank you for the invitation to speak this morning. So, yeah, I'm a, a lecturer in um, the Faculty of Health Sciences at Trinity and I'm a physiotherapist by background. And the majority of my work is focused on the role of exercise in patients with cancer. And we've done a considerable amount um, in patients, particularly with um, cancers of the um, what we call upper GI cancers, upper gastrointestinal tract cancers, such as esophageal cancer and gastric cancers um, in particular. So I suppose just as a as a summary slide as to where we are with um, evidence around, you know, the role of exercise in people with cancer. And there's lots been lots of research done in this area over the past two decades. And, you know, most recently in, in 2019, there was a big expert report, a big expert panel convened, and they concluded that at this present time, we have strong evidence that as people um, go through and recover from their treatment for cancer, there's strong evidence that being physically active either through aerobic exercise, resistance exercise, or a combination of both, um, that you can reduce symptoms of anxiety and depression, that you can reduce cancer-related fatigue, that you can improve quality of life and improve what we call perceived physical function. So the um, how patients report their abilities to engage in their normal activities of, of daily living. So aerobic exercise refers to any kind of exercise such as, you know, that gets the heart rate going and the breathing up, such as walking um, or cycling or swimming or, you know, exercise involving big muscles, lots of momentum, um, some sweat and some um, increases in breathing. And what we're aiming for to achieve these benefits with aerobic exercise is about um, 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise over a sustained period so you're talking about at least two to three months um, to reap these kinds of benefits in terms of resistance exercise you know we're talking about exercise specifically for the muscle so um weight training type exercises um when people exercise about twice per week um for all of the major muscle groups these are the kind of benefits that um, are, are coming across as well. So it's it's very much um, trying to incorporate exercise into your normal activities of daily living right from the start of diagnosis and how we can follow that through then um, into recovery. Other studies that are ongoing are looking at, well, if we exercise, can we improve how people sleep? Can we improve bone health? And there's some emerging evidence in this area. And other questions then um, that are being examined are around how exercise can help and support people who experience maybe more specific side effects, things like cardiotoxicity, so any damage that occurs to the heart as a result of treatment. Um, can we exercise to keep the heart healthy? Um, Chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, typically presenting in the fingers or toes, um, cognitive function, treatment tolerance, all of these things are all areas of interest. So they're in the red box here because we don't really have sufficient evidence to say that exercise alone can um, support these side effects or reduce these side effects. But there's a lot of work ongoing and there's a, a, a strong theoretical basis for it. So that's where we are in terms of the exercise in cancer literature generally okay now i suppose a few little caveats 
The majority of this exercise does refer to patients with breast cancer and the majority of studies in exercise have been done in patients with, um, with breast cancer, some in prostate, some in colon, but there are a number of what we would call understudied cancers and this is where our group have focused a lot of our work over the past, um, I suppose the past 10 years. As I said, we've done a lot of work in patients with upper gastrointestinal cancers, in particular um, esophageal cancer and gastric or stomach cancer. And we know that consistent with a lot of other cancers, when patients go through treatment, that they can um, become less fit, that their, their muscles can become weaker, that they find it more um, challenging to engage in their normal activities of daily living. And we would call this your functional capacity, so your ability to function and complete your normal everyday tasks. We know, however, that for esophageal and gastric cancer and other can cancers of the GI tract as well, there's a big nutritional impact. And I suppose people are struggling maybe to maintain weight, to manage symptoms, um, you know, uh, unpleasant nutritional symptoms. And this is where the work of the dietitians comes in um, very clearly. So there's these confounding elements that are impacting on how a person can, can then go forward and engage in exercise if they're really concerned about maintaining their weight. And all of these things com combined can have a profound and quite a, um, I suppose, this, uh, a unique impact on quality of life. And this is what we're concerned about. So we want to know what are the impact of a rehabilitation program that combines exercise with dietetic or nutritional support and also patient education on managing some of the um, more difficult side effects. What is the impact of that type of approach on functional capacity, on nutritional status and on quality of life in patients with these upper gastrointestinal cancers? So we really, I suppose, th there was no work done in this area when, when we started. So we're quite interested in um, what is the best way to prescribe and manage exercise in this particular group. So we designed what became known as the RESTORE trial, the rehabilitation strategies following esophageal cancer. It started as esophageal cancer, then it merged into esophageal gastric, and now it's even got a, a wider remit again in some of our, our, our newer work. But it's all underpinned by the same principle. How do we exercise patients who are at the same time really struggling with nutritional issues? So we developed a program, and you can see it here on screen, where we have combined supervised exercise, home-based exercise, one-to-one -one dietetic counselling and multidisciplinary educational sessions. And the whole purpose of Restore was to start off in a way that was very supported for the patient. So you come in for your supervised exercise twice a week and then gradually try and titrate that down so that people um, do less exercise within a supervised class environment, but at the same time do more exercise at home. So they're becoming more and more independent with the type of exercise that they can do, but are, you know, closely supported in the initial weeks. We wanted to include one-to-one -one dietetic counselling in recognition that the symptoms that patients experience aren't all going to be the same across the board. And we wanted to target individual needs that presented as barriers to exercise uh, participation and also to try and ensure energy balance because we didn't want people to take up exercise and then start losing weight where that wasn't appropriate. And finally, we do these multidisciplinary education groups where we bring in lots of different members from the multidisciplinary team. So that could include an occupational therapist, it might include a nurse, it might include a surgeon, it could include a representative from um, a patient support group. And the whole point here is to discuss issues that are common um, to patients. Firstly, to educate people and to you know, make people um, more knowledgeable about um, certain issues and how to manage them, but also, I suppose, to validate and normalize some of these issues. We found that patients shared a lot of this experiences and realized through this sharing that many people experienced the same issues and we could, you know, could be comfortable talking about them and learning from each other in this environment. So this was our, our Restore program. This is the basic principle of it. It's evolved slightly over the years, but ultimately what we want to do is create independence with exercise, provide nutritional support and provide education. So the first thing we did was a feasibility study where I suppose we brought in 12 patients and this is where patient involvement has been, has been really important to the, develop, to the development, the refining and the, the growing of Restore. We took a basic model based on the literature. 12 patients came in, they attended really well and they all stayed with the program for the 12 weeks. When we measured their fitness, their fitness improved. When we measured their function, so through a walking test, their walking improved, their um, quality of life scores improved. 
um, we saw that we could reduce some inflammatory markers through exercise. And really importantly, people didn't lose weight. So the one huge concern that came to us during initial scoping work around patients, I'd be concerned about increasing my exercise because I'm, I'm losing weight and I just lose more weight if I started to exercise. So we could exercise them safely with our dietetics colleagues and pay people maintain their weight. So that was a really important outcome. So our first piece of work established, okay, restore is feasible in this group. It's something that patients will, um, will be able to engage with. Then we did a big randomized control trial involving 43 patients, 21 in the exercise group and 22 in the control arm. So with these randomized trials, you've got lots of people in and people are just randomly assigned to one group or the other. Um, and we follow them up for, for, um, for, for changes. So the group that, um, that engaged with the exercise program in comparison to those who didn't exercise over the same time period, they did improve fitness. So we, we improved fitness with this, um, with, with the Restore program. And what's more, those gains in fitness were sustained even after the program finished. So Restore is a 12 week program, 12 weeks later, people were still fitter. They were still reaping the benefits. Again, we showed that inflammation could be reduced in the exercise group in comparison to the control group. And again, people didn't lose weight. And I suppose most importantly, and I think the next slide really shows this, the patients themselves reported or the participants themselves reported a significant impact on their own physical, social and mental well-being. And I suppose it's very hard to capture this. So one of the key things that we did was a, a focus group at the end of the Restore program to ask people, what did participation in Restore mean for you? And these are some of the key quotes that came out. So it gave you an idea that there's a good living. You can live good now after it, after the treatment. The negativity is gone in me. I can't say I'm not able. That's wrong if you do it. You're lifting too much. You're doing too much. You can do it. So a change in mindset from, you know, concern about doing certain activities to actually, I can do this. Um, if we go down to the, um, to the bottom left com comment, they said the exercise would help and it's hard to believe because you think it'll make you more tired, but it didn't. So this is a comment in reference to cancer related fatigue. It actually worked and the fatigue really lifted. So I was looking forward to coming here every time it was on. I was counting down to the time when it was on again. So, you know, we, we give a lot of advice that if you exercise, you can reduce your fatigue, but actually to engage and restore, to exercise in a very structured and supervised and supported way, people found that that actually really worked for them. And this last quote over here um, on I suppose, the, the right hand side of the screen is my favorite quote um, that we've ever collected in a, in a focus group, because I think it really resonates with people. The thing I noticed is my two sons who are into sports, you know, if there was anything going on, I wouldn't get the phone call. But now I'm getting the calls. We're going to this game or that game or the other game. So kind of their expectations have raised. OK, so this is somebody who had, you know, been treated for their cancer had disengaged from their local sporting community, which here happened to be GAA. And I suppose his own sons were a little bit concerned about bringing him back, you know, to watch matches or to get involved again. But through Restore, through, I suppose, him going out and doing his own walking at home, they could see that he was fitter, that he had physical ability. And suddenly this is a huge re-engagement back into his social community and his social circle. That's hugely, hugely important. And I suppose when we measure fitness and we measure walking tests, you know, that's one thing. They're your, your hard outcomes. But this is what it means for, for, for our participants, for patients. Um, and to me, that's, the, that's a really profound impact. So patient involvement, I suppose patients have been at the centre of everything that we have done with Restore over the number of years. We have patient representatives on the steering committee who advise on um, all aspects of the, of the protocol. Certainly with COVID this year, we have had to adapt and change the protocol. And our patient representatives have been central to how, what direction we have taken and how we have um, proposed to adapt Restore for, you know, um, more of an online delivery um, due to COVID. We've done a study within a trial. I'm going to show you on the next slide what that, what that meant. And patient-informed design. So every element of Restore that we have done so far, and we've more ongoing, we've just received more funding from the HRB to really look at Restore in a much larger context again, where we recruit over 100 participants. Um, all of that has been informed by the feedback that we have received from patients throughout the early days, the early implementation of Restore. So it has been central. 
Study within a trial is a specific piece of work that we that we completed at the start of our latest Restore project. Um, I suppose as many people who have participated in um, cancer trials or any kind of clinical trials would know, the participant information leaflet is a, a necessary um, a necessary document that's distributed at the start. It's always hugely detailed and very onerous to read. So we developed one according to the standard template that met all of the um, requirements that we had to meet. Then we held a focus group with patients on a very, very structured, um, a very, very structured focus group with the purpose of improving our participant information leaflet. And we went from the information leaflet that you see here on the left to the information leaflet that you see on the right. Same integrity, same information contained, but far superior in terms of um, accessibility to patients. So that was a really structured piece of work that we completed um, with our participants to improve our, um, our information that we, that we distribute. So finally, there is increasing evidence to support the role of exercise in cancer survivorship. However, upper gastrointestinal cancers are understudied. We need to consider not just that they need to exercise, but also other nutritional concerns, and Restore has provided the first evidence-based model in that, and patients have been central to the design, the refinement, and the implementation of Restore over the past number of years. So thank you very much for your attention and here are our contact details if you need any further information. Thank you, Emer. That's wonderful and really shows how central um, look, looking after the patient holistically, not just the treatment, but also the information, exercise, nutrition, so stop the muscle wastage and really, really help the person. Yep quality of life and their empowerment as well. So thank you, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, and again, if anybody has any questions for Emer specifically, please, um, I will keep them till the end. Um, now we have Jacqueline. Um, Jacqueline Daly is Director of Services in East Galway Midlands Cancer Support. She's also a board member for ECPC, the, uh, the East Galway, or East Galway, <laughs> I let you tell them, but also just last week she was awarded the Laura Brennan um, Award for her role in um, gynae oncology um, research um, for women in Ireland. So I'm really delighted to, uh, that Jacqueline is here today um, to talk about her work. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you, Francis, um, and thank you, everybody. I have to say I've thoroughly enjoyed the morning. Um, Yes, I am the Director of Services at East Galway Midlands Cancer Support and I sit on the board of ECPC in Brussels, which is the European Patient Coalition. So we're the biggest umbrella group for um, cancer patients in Europe. Um, I'm also a complementary therapist, so a lot of what I've heard today is absolutely music to my ears. Um, a little bit about our centre here. We, we really work on the premises that when somebody comes here, our centre has to work for them, not how we see it, because everybody is different. And we try to, teach our, to treat everybody as a whole. So we don't just look at them as somebody with colon cancer or breast cancer. It is a person who is really in crisis. We offer a host of complementary therapies, uh, which include healing touch, which I am qualified and do myself. Um, and that is actually used quite a lot in the States in a lot of, of the holistic hospitals. Um, we do um, reflexology, Reiki, bioenergy. We have a gym. We were the first gym in Ireland specifically for cancer patients. And we also encourage the families, family members to get involved as well. We run a program for children called Climb, which is amazing. Um, and it's funded by Ladies Football. But uh, before um, break or before uh, COVID-19, we were seeing about 200 people a week come through our doors. We are a small, a small charity, so it's the numbers are huge. And on the complementary therapies, what we actually, the feedback we get from the people is that it's just taken that hour for yourself to relax and just put everything out of your head. And it, it really does help with them. We also have a nutritionist who comes in once a month. And again, we've, we've heard it here over and over again uh, today, the importance of nutrition when you have a cancer diagnosis. We also do lymphatic drainage. Um, and that is something that quite often is ignored. 
Um, and it's so important that these services are actually offered to cancer patients. We don't charge for any of the services here and neither do I put a limit on what people get. And what I've found in the 10 years that we were going is that when people reach to the stage where they feel that they're independent and can go, they actually go um, and move on with their lives, which is fantastic. So there's never any pressure on them. It's the same thing when it comes to counselling. We do, it, it's clinically based, not on, you can have four sessions. Four sessions might be fine for you. I might need 10. So it is very, very individual the way we deliver our services. Um, we're starting a new program in the new year, again, relating to exercises, and that's with mobility poles. We've tried to find ways through COVID that we can continue on our services, but run the safest possible way we can. So there's three of us going to uh, train in the mobility poles, and we can take groups out walking, and we can do social distancing. Um, again, we started running all of our support groups on Zoom. Um, I think we've all learned how to use Zoom this year. And that has been really good for those who have felt um, isolated through this very, very strange year. Um, as some of the stuff that we would do with Europe, and I would encourage anybody to get in contact with me and get involved. One really important program that we're working on is the right to be forgotten. The right to be forgotten um, is being adopted by a lot of com uh, countries in Europe now where if you're diagnosed with cancer, after 10 years, you don't have that, so you go to the bank and you're looking to get a mortgage. It's not following you around. It's not going to hamper you. And unfortunately, that is one of the things that happens when you have a cancer diagnosis. And um, I'm very conscious that I'm running out of time here um, because I know there's lots of questions that people need to ask. Um, another thing that we look at um, here as well, and it, it's something that's very, very often forgotten about, I suppose when you look at somebody's health, you've got your physical, your mental and your sexual health. And one of the things that we uh, would do here is we have somebody who will come and talk to both men and women about sexual dysfunction. And I do feel that quite often it's an area that is very, very um, under-resourced. Um, I know definitely most doctors are put their head under their arm. They're just not comfortable with talking about sex. And I think we need to move away from that. On complementary therapies and doing the safest we can, we have a very close working relationship between Galway Hospital and Port Yonkta here in Banlaslow, and nobody gets treated here in the centre unless their, their oncologist has signed them off. So it doesn't matter whether it's reflexology, Reiki, healing touch, we, we always work with the permission of their oncologist. And I suppose if we all work together, that's how we'll make the difference. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Jacqueline. And again, a very modest um, person. We've had very mod modest speakers this this morning. Um, but again, um, we're talking about the whole person. Um, so we've talked about from the cell to the entire person and and Jacqueline has moved it out to the family and the community as well so what happens in one cell essentially in the body that can't be eradicated by the body itself affects not just the person but the family their their sexuality their relationships their way they the way they're able to interact in the community and um, their work life everything so these centers are so important and again doing research in these centers on the effectiveness of the centers and we um, I was very lucky to work with Jacqueline on on a PPI co-design um, uh, research that was funded by Breakthrough before I started as the research officer here. Um, and one the only the fifth study in the world to look at the costs of actually the supportive care of, of um, cancer patients. So again, thank you very much for that, Jacqueline. So now we have K. Now K is um, um, another interesting um, speaker um, today to round us off. So Kay, um, when I asked her to do this, I was going, oh my gosh, Kay has to do it. Because Kay has come the whole circle from patient to 
actual researcher um, and PPI in between. And, um, and I'm sure she would empathize with Jacqueline on the right to be forgotten as well. Um, so, and, and, uh, so Kay is going to talk about herself and also her research, which is about bringing information. And part of PPI is about informing, empowering through information. So Kay, I'll ask you to um, share your screen. Can you see that? Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. And just let me do this. Right. Okay. So can you still see that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So good morning, everyone. And um, well, it's actually it's afternoon now, isn't it? Um, yeah, um, so today I'm going to talk about um, my journey from being a patient and how I came about to become a, a researcher. So, oh, hang on. Hmm, what's going on here? Sorry. My thing is not working. Ah, it is now. So I'm just going to talk a bit about who I am first. So I find happiness in mountains, in travel, in my dog, Sonus, and my family and friends. And preferably, if I can have all of them together at the same time, I'm in total happy buzz. Um, I also, my passions are um, design. I'm a graphic designer. I'm also a UX and UI designer. Um, I love learning um, and I love health and wellness. And I'm a patient advocate. So I've always believed in giving back. So now I'm very big into PPI. So my journey as a patient started in New Zealand. Um, I was 39 in 2017 and I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I was extremely fit and healthy. I spent most of my weekends and any of my free time in the mountains. So it became a complete shock. It was a total shock that I got breast cancer. So what happened next was lots of traveling all over the South Island. Um, and while I was doing all these tests and traveling, I was learning and researching and gaining understanding about my diagnosis and the best, um, the best route for me to take um, for me personally and my own cancer. After five months, um, we had, they had discovered I had three different types of breast cancer. Um, I initially had a bilateral lumpectomy and then that was followed by a double mastectomy and immediate reconstruction. And in the November, 2017, I flew home to Ireland. So what did I learn over that time? Well, first of all, I learned that my strengths were unrational in my approach. I do a lot of research, I'm quite resilient, and I'm pretty driven. I also learned that my approach to my diagnosis was like a design project. Sorry, Kate, yeah. your, your, your slides aren't changing. Oh, are they not? No. Okay. okay, sorry, I'll go back. I'll just come out of that. Sorry about this. You're fine, it happened me earlier. That's it. So, do you see, you see this now? Yes. Thank okay, you. So, so that's just, that was that. So then what my strengths are, and that I learned that I approached um, my diagnosis like a design process, right? So the creative process is like this, visualized. It's a total mess at the start and you do loads of research, you get some understanding and you come out with a resolution at the end. And when I thought about it, the cancer journey is pretty similar. It's a complete mess at the start. You do your research and you settle on what you're going to do and then you're living with and beyond it. So I also thought about my experience as a patient. So in New Zealand, it was very collaborative driven and I felt very guided and included. I could access trustworthy information and I felt empowered. But when I compared it to my feeling in Ireland, I felt very much disconnected and um, I didn't get much guidance. I felt isolated. I struggled to find information and I became quite disillusioned. So my thoughts were as a patient, I'm struggling to access information here and find support. But as a designer, I was like, am I the only one in Ireland experiencing this? So I decided to get involved in PPI. So I joined the IACR and I became um, involved with the Irish Cancer Society and Breakthrough Cancer Research. Um, I did fundraising, I raised awareness, I, I started to interview patients and do surveys about my idea around the information gap, and I spoke with researchers as well. I then learned that I'm not the only one, but this is actually a big problem. So as a designer, it's like, how can I develop a solution? 
So I've got a wee video that I worked on with um, the social enterprise and this explains the project a lot better. So I'll just show this. My name is Kim Kim and I am a breast cancer survivor. One in two of us in Ireland will be given a cancer diagnosis in our lifetime. Cancer has touched every person in this country. Everyone knows of somebody or has some story to tell. Patients need to have the right information to make the right decisions at the right time. The information isn't the same for every type of person, every type of cancer and for every person. If there could be a hub or a portal there that patients could access um, linked with medical professionals that would be reputable um, would be a, a, an invaluable resource for patients to access. The big deficit is not knowing. If, if you put in something into the internet and you go online, then the information you're going to get is too broad. If you're struggling and you feel very much on your own, you want to be able to connect with somebody else. That voice has to be listened to. You know, it, it, it can only make our research better and the patient can really inform and can help the design of excellent research in making the quality of life better. Not knowing um, where they're going and trying to deal with the fear. In, in 2019, the Irish Cancer Society performed a scoping review. They discussed the top five unmet needs and the information deficit is amongst those top five unmet needs. Becoming a cancer survivor is one of the riskiest times for patients. Finishing their treatments and walking out the hospital door and not knowing what to do next. You know, who do I talk to? Where do I go to find out the information I need to know? So what we're aiming to do with this platform is to create an online community hub, providing access to trustworthy resources, services and supports for patients, their family, their friends, medical workers and allied health professionals. Sorry, I'm having trouble here. So now I'm studying an MA in design, which I applied for at IADT. And that's a research and design based uh, master's and it's teaching me how to um, use design tools and learn how to research properly and then how to actually run workshops, focus groups and um, learn how to understand the findings and then create solutions. And throughout this whole process, I will be doing that with patients. So now my story has turned from being the creative process to the cancer journey to now the researcher and it's a cyclical process you go through the whole reiteration you get to the end and then you go back and you start to refine and it keeps going through and it keeps refining and over time and over many years you will create better solutions so looking back i know now that i am one of the lucky ones I am grateful to my breast cancer. I found a purpose. Without it, I would not be here talking to you today and doing this research. Today, for their incredible research or their incredible support, I want to thank Breakthrough Cancer Research. And looking forward, I say, bring it on. So that's it. Okay, thank you very much. And, and what a wonderful way to to finish 2020. You know, um. What I really like, can you go back to one slide there? I think all the panelists, if all the panelists could open, could come back on the one with the with the, the squiggle going to, yeah, this, this to me, <laughs> this to me says research, okay? This to me says progress, uh, questioning and progress, you know, but I find I'm in, in the left-hand corner. <laughs> <laughs> an awful lot. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know if, if the rest of, of the panelists um feel that way, but um I want to I want to thank you all. There's been chats going on um and people have I know we've run out of time. Um I just if you would like to sum up um just if everyone would like to sum up in one um one sentence what um you know 
what's your hope for cancer research maybe? So if we go from the start, maybe John, are you there? Yeah, so John, what, what is your hope for cancer research? Um, I, I prefer to kind of uh, say what I'd hope to get from the patients because for me, this is, this is kind of a new thing. So I, I, I think I'd like them to help me guide the direction I go in. So I think that's the important point for me today, really. Okay. Yeah, um, and we go, uh, Pat's gone, Erin. Uh, um, I think the main priority really is to kind of raise the awareness of the importance of patient reported outcomes, because um, at the moment, like, you know, drug funding agencies and things, they don't necessarily take them as seriously as hard outcomes such as survival, but really to patients, what matters is quality of life and functional status and things like that. So. I think that's really important and obviously engaging with patients then to actually find out what these meaningful outcomes are is important. Yeah. Um, Emer? Yeah. Thanks, Francis. Yeah, I'd say something similar around, you know, like a patient or person centricness that, you know, everything that we do in research. So the question is around you know, the patients as opposed to any, you know, profession or, um, you know, expertise really that every question is is meaningful to patients every every piece of research that we do the outcome has it has impact for them yeah. yeah absolutely and i wanted to ask you Emer, how can we know that there's very few dietitians in oncology how many physiotherapists are there in oncology um, yeah no i don't have a, a a hard number but again there'd be very few and equally any work that we've done we've actually done work on this over the last few months and I'm yet to see the data that's come back from it but a lot of the physiotherapy services in what we would call under the umbrella of oncology and palliative care mm -hmm. in palliative care but physiotherapists are involved across the cancer journey you know through post-operative support um you know in, in respiratory roles mm -hmm. um or they might see people in their musculoskeletal roles so maybe not in oncology specific roles but we're seeing more of more of those but still very poorly and under resourced okay so it's a definite unmet need um, oh it's completely in our health it's, service along yeah, it, with um, oncology dietitians yeah. but perhaps it's actually the same so, yeah yeah, it's actually with the dietitians in particular, most of them aren't oncology dietitians per se. They're just treating patients with um, with um, cancer. Yeah. So yeah. they need to be yeah, actually in the role. Yeah. 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 And um, Jacqueline? Well, I suppose the motto for ECPC is nothing about us without us. Mm -hmm. And that I would really believe nothing about us without us. Mm -hmm. And I also firmly believe that um, information is absolutely useless until we share it. And knowledge is power. Um, and I think working with groups like this, working together is going to make such a huge difference right across the board. And again, thank you to you all. And that introduces perfectly Kay, as you say, Jacqueline, information is power. And Kay. Yeah, I totally agree. Information is knowledge, which gives you empowerment. So, you know, and that's that's fundamental to the to the cancer patient you know and for for dealing with things like anxiety and depression if you know what's going on you've got a better handle of the situation so yeah there's so much fear and there's so much unknown yeah it's good to know as much as you possibly can yeah 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 and, and and would you say so for john who's working on at the cellular level so how do we get patients involved in this research this is one of the big conundrums of ppi research yeah when we're talking to both patients and basic researchers. So, you know, how do we do that well? It's, yeah, it's just collaboration, isn't it? And willingness to collaborate. Willingness. And the more, the more we do it, the more it seems the norm and it will just happen naturally. We're, we're at the start where we're trying to be more holistic about it, but it's, you know, maybe in 20 years time, it'll be interesting to see where we're at. Well, let's go 2021 now. <laughs> let's make it a point into 2021. <laughs> and um, yeah, we have one question here for Erin and Emer. Um, so it's from an anonymous attendee. And how can I get your plans um, to patients in my hospital? 
So she's been on her own. She's had huge weight loss and muscle loss. And, you know, her, her dress size has gone down from 14 to eight. So this would, you would be very uh, familiar with this. Um, it's just dressing, um, you know, how can she, how can she get more, how can we all get more information and help for this in the hospitals? And thank you for your question. Yeah, I think it's the point that she's made about um, handouts and referrals, like at the very start of the journey, I think is really important because so many people are never going to see anyone specifically trained like as a dietitian or a physiotherapist. Um, so it's really important that patients at the start when they're being told the potential side effects of their treatments or um, being given information if it's about the drug, that they're also given information that says, you know, these services are available. And there is a dietitian if you need them or here's, um, you know, the cancer uh, cookbooks from Breakthrough are great. And they're being given out in the Mercy in Cork, but not really routinely anywhere else in the country. Um, and they should be like, you know, their availability should be kind of made aware, like, uh, yeah, made available to patients. So um, I think even that, like, because they have information in them themselves that advise people to go and get further support when they need it. Mm -hmm. And I suppose, Jacqueline, you also have these recognising the, the lack of, of these services in the hospital. You also have started um, making these available more widely in the community with, yeah, with that, research dietitians, yeah. nutritionists, physiotherapists. Yeah, and like that, because there's such a huge, um, I suppose, stress on the health system itself. Um, and if we all just sit down and do nothing, nothing is exactly what will happen. So that's why we offer as much as we can. And again, it's listening to the people who walk through our door here that we can actually try and tailor the services we offer so that it has to be what they need. Yeah. Oh, not just what sounds nice, it, it has to be a need. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose it's similar. Andrew, would you like to talk about what you've got from today or on your plans or you know hopes for 2021? That to Sorry, we can't hear you. Is that to me you're talking or to Emer? Yeah, yeah. Emer was just jumping in there. Oh, her. sorry. Oh, you're no, no. I was, I was just going to reiterate the points really made from from Erin and Jacqueline as well. That like for for that question that came in, you know, the pathways are lacking in in some areas, and like that, unless we use our Unless we ask, you know, go back and go to the back to the cancer teams, the oncologists, and raise awareness that I need this referral to a physiotherapist, I need this referral to a dietitian. And um, these go unnoticed and unrecognized, then you know. So depending on you know where you're receiving your treatment, you, you can ask and see what what services are are available locally as well, um, or within within the own, your own cancer center. And you know it's it's about raising ra raising that issue with with, with the oncologist because that's where the yeah I suppose I, I I just want to reiterate the the um the importance of the advocate then the family member who will come yeah. and ask those questions yeah. and who that they're informed also and you know especially if they're older parents who won't ask these things that you know there's yeah. somebody there who will ask yeah yeah absolutely so yeah, yeah. Orla would you like to sum up yeah I mean um. Uh, fascinating talks from everybody from the like you said down to the very cellular level and even um, John I've heard of Bart's esophagus and things like that as precursors but like understanding how that's actually working um, I think even for the people who are working at the very molecular level um, it is very important to kind of think about the plan of where this research like we will fund research from the very very beginning but we want people to understand what is the patient challenge you are looking to, to, to overcome at the end. Um, where is it supposed to go? Because if you don't have that mindset in terms of treatment design or some interventional design at the end, then you can take your research off in a direction that might not might, might contribute to knowledge, but ultimately for breakthrough, we want patients to benefit from what we're funding. So, so we're trying to, to kind of have a mindset. They won't all work out, but, uh, but we need to have that mindset of ultimately patients is who we want to benefit from the research that we're doing. Um, and so we encourage everybody to also talk to um, researchers at every level because 
you know, if somebody's going to develop a treatment and one is less invasive than the other, and that's more important to patients, then we need to know that. And they need to know that in the design so they don't go off and do something that's quite brutal because these are things that have an effect further down the, the channel. Um, in terms of some of these things, like once they come out of interventional studies and we understand with, say, Ephanadine, which Aaron referred to, that that this is a gap and we need to fill the gap, then we will work to help publish these cookbooks and make them available in all hospitals. The uptake in those hospitals might not be great, but they're sitting out there. Sometimes coming to these events means you find out that they're there and you can go out and ask for them then because they're seeing, you know, you know, hundreds of people in a clinic. And sometimes you're going to have to advocate for yourself at the moment because the people don't have the time or they're not, they don't even have the, the ways of um, checking for weight loss in a, in a better way unless things get into a crisis situation. And we want it to not be in a crisis situation. Um, so look, I suppose in summation from us, it's a huge varied amount of ways that research can have a positive impact for patients and we want to be part of that but again like I said at the beginning it's the we're a hundred percent supported by the public so um and patients and people who are out there fundraising so for us that's a really important thing that we make sure that when we are taking the the fibers and the 50 euros and the 5,000 euros from people who want to see research happen, that it goes to really productive research that's going to make a difference. And patients input in that is the thing that helps us make those kind of decisions. It has to be good science. It has to be good science. And that's a given. But what are the priorities for, for patients? And can we make sure that our, our funding is going to those locations? So everybody had to give a lot of time today in preparation in advance and also, you know, um, taking up time when we might be all Christmas shopping now. You never know. But I just want to say thanks a million to everybody for participating because this type of dialogue is what helps us drive forward. And it also generates new ideas and new connections between people who might not have met before that they can figure out. So, so thanks to everybody for the time and thanks to Francis for organising. Thank you absolutely everyone. I hope you all, I'm sorry to the attendees who the way we had to do this meant that we can't see all your faces as well and, and hear you. Um, we will have another interactive where we can see and hear you um, at the end of January. So hope we see you then. And I want to wish everyone happy Christmas, a very happy and healthy 2021 with vaccine in place and um, brilliant research for people. Thank, Thank you very you much. much. Happy Thank you. Bye now. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye. Thanks, Francis. Bye.